The former Secretary of State John Kerry this week became the first Biden administration official to travel to China. Now, before he made that trip, I spoke to him and began by asking how urgent it is that the world takes action on climate change. Well, it's extremely urgent. Uh, I mean, the word urgent is, is totally applicable to the current crisis that we're in because countries are simply not getting the job done. Uh, even if we did everything that we set out to do in the Paris Agreement, the Earth's temperature is going to increase a very significant amount, perhaps as much as 3.7 degrees or more. And the, reason, and, and the reason for the real urgency now is that because we're not getting done what we said we'd do in Paris, it's actually heading towards 4 degrees or more. That's beyond catastrophic in the consequences to food production, water, uh, habitability in various parts of the planet, the melting of ice, the sea level rise the warming, all the consequences. So we have an opportunity to get on track. Uh, the United States has a summit next week, uh, the President Biden is hosting, and we will be uh, setting forth our plan to try to do our part. And we hope uh, to raise ambition among all nations over the course of these next months. As you say, at the Earth Day summit, uh, President Biden is expected to uh, tell us what the US's emissions targets are. Given the fact that you're the second biggest emitter in the world and that you haven't even been in the Paris Agreement in recent years, is it not the U.S.'s duty to actually set the most ambitious targets in the world? Well, it's the U.S.'s duty certainly to return to the Paris Agreement, as President Biden has done, and to work with other nations to do the maximum amount possible. I can assure you that the United States will do its part to help keep uh, us on track to have a 1.5 degree rise, the limit. That's what that's our goal. And then to head to 2050, where we would be net zero. And we hope that other nations will join us uh, to raise the ambition to be able to hold that 1.5 degree uh, limit on the increase of Earth's temperature. Uh, obviously, to do that, we're all going to have to do our part. I mean, yes, we are number two in the world in emissions. And, and uh, we helped to put the Paris Agreement together, and now we're going to do everything in our power to help get Glasgow to do what it needs to do to put the world on a track in these next 10 years to accomplish our goal. But the, the simple reality is no one nation does this alone. Even if the United States went to zero tomorrow, or the UK did, or Europe, the fact is that uh, you know, China, which is almost 30 percent of the world's emissions, uh, other countries, India, Russia, Indonesia, Japan, there are a lot of industrialized countries that are contributing to this challenge. Twenty nations, all of whom are invited to President Biden's summit, uh, are responsible for about 81 percent of all the emissions. So to solve this problem, those 20 countries have to lead the way. We recognize that responsibility. We are very <laughs> sorry for uh, the last four years with the president who didn't care about science and who didn't uh, have a real rationale for pulling out, but he was the only president in the world, the only leader in the world who pulled out of this agreement. President Biden said the first thing you do as president is return. We've done that. And now with this summit, we're going to try and bring nations to the table to do what we need to do to get the job done for future generations. Of course, there's a responsibility, as you say, uh, on everyone, but particularly those countries that make up 80 percent of emissions. At the same time, you know, the U.S. is responsible for up to 15 percent of emissions. China is responsible for 30 percent. You know, some of our viewers might be thinking, is it really going to make a difference if people in the U.K. eat less meat or cycle more when you consider these colossal emissions coming out of the U.S. and China? Of course, it makes a difference because every country has to join this effort. As I said a moment ago, no one country, no one entity like the EU can solve the problem. This is, this is an unbelievable monument, the climate crisis, to the need for multilateralism. This is why we have a UN. This is why we bring nations together. And unfortunately, the United States became a renegade in the last four years under uh, the non-leadership of President Trump. But we are now uh, back and present with a very aggressive uh, uh, series of initiatives in order to try to make up for lost time. We need to address this challenge. And the beauty of it is this creates jobs. 
in the, in the addressing of this, in the deployment of solar, of wind, in the further explorations with respect to hydrogen, fuel, uh, in the creation perhaps of storage or longer term batteries. These are all jobs. You make electric vehicles, you have people who are going to make them. I mean, this is the biggest economic opportunity the world has seen since the Industrial Revolution. Nearly a third of the world's emissions come from China. You are planning to travel to China this week to discuss climate issues? We have been in touch with China. I've talked to my counterpart uh, a number of times. Uh, we recognize that uh, China, nearly 30 percent of the world's emissions, is essential to resolving this crisis. And our hopes are that China is prepared to uh, assume responsibility as we are and as other nations are. Um, this is not a moment where uh, any nation can not step up to raise the ambition that Paris envisioned. Uh, and, and what we're doing now is not something that we've instigated particularly. It's the automatic follow-on to the Paris Agreement, that we would reconvene, we will take stock of where we are. There's a formal take stock in three years, but already the UN agency responsible for making judgments about the science, the IPCC, has told us two years ago that we have about 12 years within which to make the most critical decisions to reduce the most damaging impacts of climate. We're now two years down the road. We haven't done that yet. We have, whatever, nine years, eight years to make those decisions, and that's what Glasgow is about. It's a moment when we all come together from around the world and we commit to do more. There are, of course, pretty big disagreements between the US and China uh, on trade. Also, you've described the treatment of the uh, Uyghur Muslims as a genocide. Can you really have a productive conversation with China about climate change? Absolutely, of course we can. Climate change is about the survival of the planet. Every nation has a stake in the outcome of the climate issue. And, and, and big, powerful nations, historically, have proven that they have the ability to be able to discuss difficult issues even as they disagree on them. Okay. Uh, when I was Secretary of State, we dealt very directly with Russia even after we had sanctioned them for the invasion of Crimea and Ukraine. Uh, we continued to have tough conversations about that even as we made progress on the Iran nuclear agreement, on the Paris agreement, on other environment issues. So yes, uh, you know, President Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev met at Reykjavik and lowered the number of nuclear weapons pointing at each other, despite the fact Reagan thought the Soviet Union was the evil empire. We can have those conversations, and that is the real stuff of diplomacy. That's what you have to do, uh, is try, you know, the failure of diplomacy is war, and the object of the diplomacy is to avoid that. I am keen to ask you about the protests that we've seen in Minneapolis uh, after another black man uh, shot by police. Of course, it came after the killing of George Floyd, which sparked protests around the world. What's your reaction to what we've seen? Well, obviously, uh, we're living through a very painful moment in our country with respect to race uh, and uh, policing and the challenges of keeping communities whole and together. Uh, we've had a terrible history, unfortunately of uh, uh, police stops and a relationship with African Americans particularly, but with, uh, you know, racial overtones for a long period of time. And we need to get beyond it. Uh, that's one of President Biden's real missions that he has taken on, is to heal America and bring America back together. Uh, but at the same time as I say that, and people are angry and frustrated at the deaths uh, of people at the hands of, uh, you know, really incomprehensible situations. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we, we, we also cannot condone or accept the fact that the legitimate protest to that is go out and loot a Walmart or destroy property. Protest is protest, and it's important that that protest uh, be nonviolent. Uh, otherwise, you begin confusing everything and losing uh, the importance of the message that you have. But these are serious. Uh, uh, challenges and uh, I used to be a prosecutor. I know how d difficult policing is, but at the same time, uh, I also know the lives that uh, young African Americans, particularly, have led in our country, uh, being stopped in places and for circumstances that no white person would be stopped in. And so we have to uh, meet that challenge. We've got some tough conversations to have and some actions to take.
one last quick question to squeeze in, because I know it's something that we yeah. talk about an awful lot in the UK, uh, analysing that relationship between the UK Prime Minister and the US President. How would you describe the relationship between Joe Biden and Boris Johnson? Well, I, I, the best of my knowledge, they, they are friends and get along well, and, and uh, we're working together on a lot of uh, key issues that matter to both of us. Uh, so I, I have no knowledge of anything else.